Okay, so I, I just want to real quick, today I, we're not going to get all the way through this. I want to give you some time to uh, work on an assignment. Uh, this uh, solve inequalities, we've got um, um, bless you. We've got a couple different concepts here with inequalities. So I want I want to do just uh, solving individual inequalities first, and then we'll uh, practice that today. Um, and then on Monday, uh, remember we've got quiz tomorrow. On Monday, um, we'll pick up with the rest of this this section. I'm doing the, the the they're called compound inequalities. That's where we'll pick up on Monday. The one thing I want to reiterate from yesterday is if I'm going to graph a less than or greater than, then that means I'm going to have to use an open dot or a parenthesis. Okay? Uh, and the parenthesis can change directions. If I'm going to use less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, that means I'm going to have to, on my graph, use a closed dot or a square bracket. People get these confused all the time. And this is what I was talking about at the end yesterday in the bell rang. When you are using these, the way I remembered it when I was your age is that if I'm comparing the, the inequality symbols from these blue ones to these red ones, which ones required me to use more ink to draw? The bottom ones, the red ones, right? So when I go open or close dot, the closed dot requires more ink, right? So it reminds me that an inequality that has an equality aspect to it, you're going to use a closed dot. Same thing with the parentheses and the bracket. If, if we kind of looked at it and, and went into measuring how much ink was used here for this parenthesis and how much for this bracket, the bracket is going to be more. Okay? So the, the more you have to write uh, for your inequality symbols, the more you should write for the symbols in your graphs. And I think if you can make that connection, it will help you remember uh, that. Because my fear, and this happens all the time, is that you do all the algebra right, but you choose an open dot versus a closed dot, and you get the question wrong, okay? Uh, but everything else was done correctly. The, uh, the parenthesis basically is the idea that values are excluded endpoints. Endpoints are excluded. I mean, they're kicked out. They're not part of the answer. Uh, even though the way we write it, it shows up in our final kind of graphic, but we interpret it as not an answer. Uh, and this means that the endpoint is included. Okay? Sometimes they'll refer to this as being exclusive and this being inclusive. Okay. Um, and as we see some examples here in a little bit, uh, we, will, we will talk about the necessity of understanding those two concepts. All right. Um, when we, I, I've got the, the proof or the explanation here of why we must um, reverse an inequality symbol when we multiply or divide by a negative. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into that right now. Let's just get into some practice problems. And once we finish the practice problems and we get a good understanding of what we're doing there, um, maybe again on Monday we'll come back and actually talk about why we have to uh, show or reverse that, that inequality when we, when we divide or multiply by a negative. Okay? Um, first thing, I've got some examples here. I actually want to do a little bit of a simpler example just so we can talk about a concept real quick. Uh, so let's go to like the side of that paper or maybe flip to the back, and we'll just do a, a straightforward, pretty simple one here. Um, let's say we have 2x plus 4, uh, I'm going to say is greater than, uh, just make things easy, we'll keep it a whole number, greater than 16. All right. So yesterday, we talked about when we're solving a linear inequality, and when I say linear inequality, what I mean by that is that if we were to graph the left-hand side of this all by itself, 2x plus 4, and if we are graph the right-hand side all by itself, the 16, both of those things are going to be lines. 
Okay. Um, linear, we talked about last week, um, or maybe it was the week before, has an exponent of 1. That's the greatest exponent in the equation, um, or in this case, the inequality. So this is linear. Okay. With linear inequalities, you solve them just like you solve equations. So if I was, if, if I was to view this sign right here as an equal sign, what would you do first in that uh, problem to solve for x? Subtract 4 from both sides. So I'm going to minus 4 here, minus 4 there. That's going to bring down my 2x. The inequality sign is still pointing to the right. And then I've got 12, right? You're going to hear me talk about, like, just instead of saying, like, 2x is greater than 12, I, we do need to understand that, and I will use that. But I will, you'll hear me say the inequality is pointing in a certain direction, especially when we have to reverse them. I think about my inequality symbol as being, like, the, the, the head of an arrow, okay? Um, it is pointing and always pointing to the smallest value. Okay, um, if you go back to like fifth grade where they talk about like alligator eats the bigger number or something like that, right? Okay, so you can think about it that way if you want to. I like the arrow points to the smallest value. Um, what would you do if this was an equation? What would you do next? Divide by two, and then you've got x is greater than six, right? Okay. Now, what that, the way we read that, x, you don't have to write this, is greater than 6. Okay? So here's my question. And it, think about it before you answer it. But what is the, what is a, what is the first number greater than 6? I heard 7. I heard 6.6.1 .6 .6 is better than 7. 6.0000000 as many times as I can say zero and then slap a one on the end of it, right? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. Seven is the first whole number after six. 6.1 6 is the first number with the precision of the high, or the tenth place after six. But there are, no matter what two numbers I choose on the number line, let me give you a visual of this real quick. Um, Let's say that we we look at our number line. Let's say I put um, uh, what's the best way of doing this? Huh? I'll use this all the time. Um. Well, yeah, if I'm grocery shopping and I, I can't spend more than $7, or I've got to spend less than $7, that means I can spend $6.99, right? It doesn't mean if I can spend less than $7, it doesn't mean I, I can only spend something that costs up to $6, right? Because then I'll have essentially 99 more cents at my disposal that I can use. If I'm speeding, okay, speed limits, speed limits, so let's say 65 miles an hour. I can go 64.999999 miles per hour without getting a ticket, right? Okay, I can go 65 too, yeah. I could probably go 75, but... The, there, there's a lot of things that we, that we can use, and we'll talk about them um, let, let's get let's get through the process, and then we'll we'll get through the the places that we can use this. So seven zero, okay. Um, and, and just kind of a, a a holistic answer to a question like that. Let's think about this. Do you play any sports or anything? No. Um, let's say Austin plays football, right? Well, he watches everybody else play. Uh, but you're supposed to, in football, prepare for the season by weightlifting. Again, something he watches other people do. But Austin, you go, you go weightlifting, and you, you bench during weightlifting, right? You squat during weightlifting. You do curls. 
do jumping jacks. No, but you do you do exercises and lifts in the weight room that are going to prepare you for your football game, right? But during a football game, do you ever go out on the 50-yard line and do a bench, do a curl, do a squat? You don't do those things, right? But you're prepared. But you prepared your body to be able to do those things, right? So in realm of this class, you, we, we, there, there's going to be a lot of things that you're never going to use in your life ever again. Okay, I don't want to lie to you. There, there's the, probably a majority of this stuff that we talk about you're not going to use again. But what we're doing is we're preparing your mind to think analytically, to think mathematically, so that when you do get in a situation that you have to think that way, you've, you, you've trained yourself to be able to do that successfully. Does that make sense? So we're training your mind, training your um, skill set to be able to perform in a situation later on of problem solving. Because we have to problem solve all the time, right? So this is training us how to problem solve for later on. Um, if I look at six and seven, okay, these two points, and I'm going to, let's make this, let's have six and seven, let's go B, shut up, and A. All right, so what I've got here is the ability to just to kind of slide these points uh, anywhere I want to, okay? Um, if I look at, let's just say, between these two numbers, one and two, okay? And I ask you, how many numbers are there between one and two? And it might be easier if we get rid of the, uh, the grid here and the axes. Um, and, and just remember that there are, if there's a gap between them, there are numbers that could be put between them. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I bring these two things, there's obviously numbers that exist between 1 and 2, and there, there are, are like 1.1, 1.2, those types of things. Uh, let's bring these a little bit closer to one another, like that. Can I still zoom in and still have a gap of numbers between them? Can I do this? I can still zoom in, right? Now, in order to get this done effectively... Let's change the increment on this to be 0 0.001. And I'm zoomed in far enough to where I actually need to go more. Well... The idea is I should – oh, there we go. I can slide it that way. Okay. So I should be able to slide these really, really close to one another, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So those two numbers are very, very, very close to one another. And if I put the rounding on here, you'll see that they're really not the same number. Okay. But I should be able to zoom in, and there still be a gap between them, right? Do the same thing. If I, I put my grid back on here, maybe that'll help a little bit. Actually, you see how we're zoomed in now, really close to this too, but I can zoom in even further, and there's a gap between them. And I can still do that all the time, right? As long as you give me two numbers that are different, I can always find a gap between them that is infinitely big, where there's infinite number of values between them. Does that make sense? That idea is being expressed right here when I ask you, okay, what is the first number bigger than 6? Well, you say 6.1. There is an infinite number of values between 6 and 6.1. You say 6.01. There's an infinite number of values between 6 and 6.01. Does that make sense? I can keep doing it. As precise as that 6.0001 number gets, there's always going to be an infinite number of values between it and 6. So how do I express it? I can't write those down. I can't just write down every single number that exists in between uh, those values that's bigger than 6. So what we do is we show our answers graphically. Okay? We're going to draw our number line. Okay? A 
little bit bigger. And I'm going to put at this stage, and you can do this on top of the graph. I think in, in Math Excel, they actually graph on top of the number line. Um, I'm going to do it above the graph. Um, but what you do is you find that value right there on your number line. And now you're going to decide what kind of dot do I use. Well, if it's just greater than, you're going to use, we talked about that being the open dot, right? So I'm going to draw an open dot. Okay. And now this is what I like to be able to do. If the variable is written first, in my x is greater than 6 algebraic statement, my inequality is actually pointing to the direction I need to graph. It's pointing to the right, correct? If this were an arrow here, it's pointing to the right. Okay? So it's telling me graph to the right. Okay? Um, now, if the variable, and I, and I I told my students this last year, okay, if the variable is coming second, you can't do that. You can't use the arrow telling me which way to graph. So the variable, ha if you're going to use that technique, you have to write the variable first. So x is greater than 6 gives me that. Now, why do I have to use an open dot? This open dot right here is telling us that idea that you are not including 6. 6 is not an answer. Because if I put 6 in for x, is 6 greater than 6? No. Okay? But is 6.1 greater than 6? And that image right there shows me that, okay? It's 6.0000000000000001 greater than 6. Yes. And that's showing me with this open dot that you can get as close to 6 on this side as possible, as close as you want, but you can't step over onto 6. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Now... That's using an open dot. Sometimes they'll use a parenthesis. So they'll come down here on 6, and they'll put a parenthesis. And then they'll draw their arrow that way. And the parenthesis kind of opens to the direction that the arrow is being drawn. So this opens to the right because the arrow is being drawn to the right. Does that make sense on what that structure, that graph means to us? Okay. If you were to say that 7 is the first number, you would be saying, so if I said 7 is the first number bigger than 6, I would be saying that that is a solution right there, which it is. But if that was the first solution, do you see all the infinite solutions right there that we miss? Does that make sense? Okay. If, if we accidentally chose the wrong symbol here, we made a bracket or we closed in the dot. You have a lot of answers that are right, but you would have one answer that is wrong, right? Okay, and the, the, the concept there is, um, let me see if I can just cut and paste this real quick, make it quicker to talk about. If I were to look at, uh, let's see here, this red one, in comparison to the black one, but I color this red one in. Maybe. Color that red one in and make this a bracket. Okay. If I overlap those two things, they are the same for an infinite number of solutions, but they are different for one value at six, correct? That red one, I'm including six. That would, even though I've got a lot of solutions that are, that are shared and that are right, that red one would be a wrong solution for my inequality. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and the idea of that is, you know, you could, be, you could be a great citizen for, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost 36 years old, so that's, uh, pro I think it's about uh, close to like 1,400 days, or f sorry, 14,000 days. Okay, so 14,000 days old, okay? I could be a great citizen for 14,000 days, but the next day I go commit a felony, now I'm a felon for the rest of my life, right? It gets, even though I have 14,000 days that were good, one bad day makes me bad forever. Does that make sense? Okay. We have an infinite number of solutions up there that are, that are matching, that are good, but one bad solution, one incorrect 
makes all of them wrong. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have to be very, very aware of the correct symbols to use um, in our solutions. No, I'm not. Minor traffic violations. That's it. Yeah, that's what they are. All right, so let's do this example. Okay, so solve the following inequalities and graph the solution. So the idea is because we're solving equa essentially an inequality, a linear inequality, we're solving just like a linear equation, all the equations that we've come across in the past, all the varying types, uh, structures, uh, all the order of operations that have been involved in those are going to be seen here. Okay, um, so we've seen some like this in the past. What do I need to do first here to start working uh, with this particular problem? Viewing, again, viewing that as it was an equal sign. Right? Okay, distribute my negative 3. So that's going to give me negative 6x plus 15 plus 1, and then it's greater than or equal to 4. Would, was anybody going to say something different that they could have done? We all would have distributed the negative 3? Okay. Would it have been okay to subtract 1 from both sides? It would have been okay. Okay. Um, the, some of those steps are independent of one another um, with these equations. So, what would you do next? Good. So you're going to look at one side, right, and the other side. So that, that right-hand side is kind of trivial. There's nothing over there to combine. But look on the yellow, hand, or yellow side, you're going to combine the like terms. So that's 15 and 1, right? So we get negative 6x plus 16 is greater than or equal to 4. Now what would you do? Subtract 16. And you get negative 6x greater or equal to negative 12. Now what are you going to do? Divide both sides by negative 6. And it leaves you x. And we'll come over here. Negative 12 divided by negative 6 is 2. What do we divide by, though? We divide it by a negative. So what's that mean I have to do with that symbol I just highlighted? Change its direction. So we're going to do that. And with this example, my hope is to be able to show you kind of visually here in a moment why we have to change that. Okay, so coming up to my graph, I'm just going to find, and this is the way that I do graphs uh, in class, guys, is... I know zero is going to be on my graph somewhere, so I just put on my graph a zero. And you, your zero could be completely different where, than where mine is. But two is going to be to the right of zero, right? So I put two there. Now, you could put it closer if you want to. You could put it further away if you want to. Uh, you can actually, a, a lot of people like to actually go one, two, three. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um, just to save a little bit of time, I just usually put zero and then the number that I'm dealing with. Okay. Um, and now, because my variable is coming first, I can use this as an arrow telling me which way I've got to draw my line, right, or shade. And because it's less than or equal to, less than or equal to, what kind of dot would I use? I'm going to color it in. I'm going to be a solid dot. And then you're going to shade to the left. If we were using brackets and parentheses, because it's equality, we use a bracket. And you're going to shade to the left. I, I use both those because there's questions that I'll pull from multiple textbooks for tests, quizzes, homework. Some authors will use the shaded dot. Some will use the bracket. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you're aware of those if that ever pops up. Um, 
So what does that mean to us? That means that zero, anything that is shaded, anything over here that is a number that is going to be um, identified by this graph is a solution to the original inequality, meaning that we should be able to go back into this. I should be able to pick off any one of these numbers that are over here uh, in that shaded region, right? I should be able to pick off any one of those numbers, plug it in to the original inequality, and get a true statement. Okay? So let's try that. Let's try that with zero. Zero is one of those numbers, right? So let's plug zero in. If I plug zero in, I have negative three. Two times zero is going to give me what? Zero. Minus five. And then plus one. Is that greater than or equal to four? Okay, so what's 0 minus 5? Negative 5. So that's what that's going to turn into. That thing's going to turn into negative 5. So now what's negative 3 times negative 5? 15. So that's going to turn into 15 plus 1. What's 15 plus 1? 16. Is 16 greater than or equal to 4? Yes. That's a true statement, right? Any number that is over here is going to give me something like that, okay? It's not going to give me the exact 16 back. So if I tried like 1 here, okay, 1 is going to give me back. Let, let's actually use maybe Desmos here real quick to, to help out with this calculation. If we had, so we got the negative 3. 2x minus 5 plus 1, okay? Uh, now, because of the x, it's going to graph things. So I'm going to change the x to an a real quick to make this a little bit easier. But look at this. If, if I'm able to go from, let's say a goes from, we said 2, and then here, I don't know if I could type in negative infinity if it'll do anything. No. Let's just type in like negative 100 for the moment. But look at this. As long as I choose a number to the left of 2, okay, so you agree 1 is to the left of 2, right? So this slider right here is representing all of these purple things that we had on our graph. And it's going to take that number and plug it in here and evaluate. Would you say that 10 is greater than or equal to 4? Does that make sense? Would you say that, so let's see if we can change that to um, zero. We see the 16 that we got, right? No matter what number I choose over here, is this number right here always going to be bigger than four? That kind of makes sense? Now I'm only going to negative 100, but this line here, this arrow is showing we should be able to go to negative infinity. We should be able to, like, negative 100 billion. Okay, uh, and even bigger than that, we will always get a number here that is bigger than or equal to 4. Does that make sense? If we did not change the inequality symbol, we divided by a negative. Let's say that we would have, what's going on with my cursor here? There we go. Let's say I didn't flip this inequality symbol. So I just did the division and got x greater than or equal to 2. Well, if I start plugging in numbers that are bigger than 2 into my Desmos here, let's say, so numbers that are bigger than 2, let's go from 2 to 200 here. Plug in those numbers. Do you see how it's going to give me a number like negative 74? Is negative 74 greater than or equal to 4? So anything bigger than 2 is actually going to make this a false statement, okay? Um, so that's the idea of uh, the logic on why we have to flip it when we divide by a negative. Because if we don't, it actually gives you all the things that are not answers instead of all the things that are answers, okay? So you've got to be careful that when you divide or multiply by a negative number. 
Is that right? Got questions on this so far? Worried about anything so far? Why don't you guys do the next one on your own? What's confusing you? For the one we just did? For the next one? Well, let's let's uh, let's give everybody a couple seconds, minutes to uh, to be confusing. Uh, if you're doing, it, I want to make sure that you you don't think that you're doing something wrong here. Um, what would you do first? Distribute. Okay. So negative two times three x is negative six x. Negative two times one is negative two. Greater than negative six x plus seven. What would you do next? Add two to both sides, so I get negative six x greater than negative six x plus nine, right? Added two there, added two there. Now what'd you do? Careful. You gotta get your variable terms by themselves first, right? You got x's on both sides. We gotta get those all those x's on one side. Once you add six here and add six there, or six x, what's that give you on the left? Zero. What happens on the right? You get nine. You've done all your math right, and this is this is what Jenna said earlier. She's like, I think I did something wrong. You you did everything absolutely one hundred percent right. And you get down to this, and this is fine as long as you understand your math and you're, you're convinced that you did your math right. You you abide by all your operations. You get a statement like this. Can I answer that statement as true or false? That's false, right? Zero is is zero greater than nine. That is false. Okay. And we won't see too many like this, but there's no solution. When you get a false statement, there's no solution. Okay? No solution. If I were to graph these, and uh, I'll use Desmos just because it would be a little bit quicker, I think. Remember we talked about yesterday when I showed you the graphs of being able to see where they're equal and then everywhere else they're unequal? Well, if I graph the left-hand side as negative 2 times 3x, plus 1, and the right-hand side has negative 6x plus 7. And the question is, when is the black one, when is the black one greater than the red one? Well, the black one is always below the red one. Does that make sense? They're actually parallel. So they never intersect, so they're never equal. Therefore, they're always going to be unequal in some fashion, and this is not the fashion that they're unequal. This one is, this says that the, the black one should be above the red one, and that's false, okay? If I, if I ask the question, if this was flipped, if that was less than, you would have this statement. Zero is less than nine. What does that mean? That's true. So then that would be all solutions, all real solutions are, are your answer there, okay? Let's stop there. Um,